Hello, and welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. We are on a mission to encourage and inspire you as you're navigating this life and your relationship with Christ. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and today I'm joined by my handsome husband and co-host of this marriage series, Mike Toomey. I'm back. (laughs) He's back. He's still here. I'm back. It's me. We're still here. Still in the same house. I'm upstairs. She's downstairs. We're doing it. We're in the same outfit. We're in the same outfit. Happy Easter, (laughs) y'all. Wearing our matching outfits is what, you know, I'm wearing a dress. You're wearing a shirt. No, we're wearing the same outfit. I'm wearing a dress too. (laughs) Wouldn't that be, you know, what actually is funny is it, I think it's funny that when they have matching family pajamas, that the man pajama pants are like the wide leg ones and the women's one are those joggers and Mike and I trade because he yeah. likes the jogger ones and I like the wide leg ones. So I, like I don't the, know why the they do that though. Ones. It feels like European. They feel really fancy to me. The the tight leg ones. I like them. <laughs> like I like work. them because yeah, well, I like the, the part with the elastic at the bottom because if I get hot, I could pull them up and then they stay up. Mm-hmm. that's that's kind of why i like them the most i don't know i just don't like things clinging onto my legs i like them loose flowy i know i know that's <laughs> you honey i'm i'll glad that i'll give you my pajama pants anytime yeah well, you're it's great to be able to trade i mean i guess i could just give you the whole outfit huh but the women's shirt is usually like a little slimmer cut or maybe so, you, know. you could get us matching nightgowns at some point okay. <laughs> we'll just wear big nightgowns Oh my gosh. Remember that show? What was it? Um, I sure do. Love it at first Married sight. at first sight. Married at first sight. And the guy yeah. wore a nightgown. Yeah. Yeah. That guy was really cool. <laughs> I would be his friend. Yeah. He, you're not really going to wear a nightgown. Remember when that whole thing came around where there was like man nightgowns and I was like joking that I was going to get you one as an Instagram prank. I know. I, I was hoping that you were going to get it for me. <laughs> But I didn't know if it was a test or not, if you were testing my manhood or or what it was. But secretly, I was hoping that you were really going to get it from me. You really want a nightgown? Um, you know, I'll try anything once. I, oh, I would Mike. Maybe wear it. I feel like it'd be very free, you know. It, it may be really freeing. I've heard that the kilt is, is very freeing. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know. But that's enough to talk about nightgowns. We can talk about that for another. That could be a whole <laughs> another episode, I think. A, a, a whole episode on you wearing a nightgown. All right. Yeah. I mean, you never know. <laughs> well, we'll see you guys. I don't think that's probably going to happen, though. I don't think I'm going to get a nightgown. I don't um, think that's going to make it on the agenda for the Radiant Mission podcast either. Probably not. There's bigger fish to fry. <laughs> there are. There are. And we've well, got one of them today. Yeah. If you are just jumping into this series for the first time today, we're actually talking about relationships and marriage and growing together, (laughs) not nightgowns. And so far we have discussed the five love languages, the crazy cycle from the book, love and respect, embracing oneness, learning to love like Christ, extending grace. And last week we talked about practicing forgiveness. Today we're focused on learning to communicate and resolve conflict. And see how important it is to communicate. It's why we have a husband and wife duo here to talk about this since, you know, we've had to learn how to communicate with each other too over the years. And it continues to evolve. So kind of like practicing forgiveness, communication takes a lot of practice too. And I think that we're always going to be learning how to communicate effectively as we're growing and changing and different seasons of life. Because it's very communicating now is very different than when we communicated before we had kids. Yeah. Because now, like, we can't even talk about some things in front of our kids because that is not good. We have to save it. And I'm definitely not used to saving, having to save things. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Becky doesn't, Becky doesn't save much. She doesn't hold back. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I want to, early in this episode, I want to, mentioned something that I think is really important. I'm going to throw out some stereotypes that I totally acknowledge. This is going to be stereotypical, but I hope that people can get some value out of it, out of these generalizations that I'm going to make. (laughs) I think that men 
tend to not be as good of communicators as women are. I think that women are better at expressing their feelings and that they want to sit down and talk. Men, at least I'll speak for myself, I tend to be more keep it to myself. I don't, I'll work it out, you know, not, I don't need to talk about my feelings. And it really is good for men and women to meet in the middle on that. And then the advice that I would give to women, including my own wife, which I think is, is important. You, honey, are a wonderful communicator, but I think that sometimes women can think or want or expect their husband or significant other to know what they're thinking or what they're feeling without them saying it. It's like, they just want you to know. And I think that it's much better if you could get that out and not like just expect someone to know something off the bat. Mm -hmm. Like mind reading, you mean? Yeah. Like mind reading, like expecting like they just well he should know that I feel this way or he should know this well, you like should. we don't no, know anything <laughs> men don't know anything at <laughs> all like we have no idea we have one box in our head and it's totally empty you know so oh you gotta tell really, the story about the boxes the, I don't even a, I don't even a know how to, skit, to tell I think. that it's a comedian skit and they're basically like women have all these boxes going on in their heads and they're all full overflowing into one another and men have one box and it's completely empty no (laughs) i think it's that men have some boxes but then men also have something women don't have and it's called the nothing box oh yeah yeah maybe that sounds right and it's where they can just go into nothing nothing and women don't have that most of our time in the nothing box i'll tell you that (laughs) You know, I could give an example of this because this is something that uh, like a real life struggle that Mike and I have had to me, lack of communication is just as bad as like poor communication. So if he's going to work, for example, and he knows he's going to play disc golf at lunch because he brought his disc golf bag and his exercising outfit and his shoes and all the things that he needs to go play disc golf. And then I find out like the next day that he played disc golf with these people. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me? And you're, and he'll be like, I'm telling you now. I'm like, you're not telling me now. I asked you. And that is an example of, I'm the type where it's like, tell me I'm going to play disc golf at lunch today. And he's the type that is just not going to say anything about it. And then I find out about it when he tells me, Oh, I talked to so-and-so when I was playing disc golf. And then I'm like, when did you play disc golf? Anyway, there's an example. (laughs) Yeah. I've gotten in trouble for that a couple of times. (laughs) Becky's a communicator. If I don't say something, because to me, like, It's like no big deal what I do at lunchtime, but to Rebecca, it's basically like I'm lying and hiding something from her (laughs) that I played disc golf with my coworkers for 30 minutes during lunch, you know, Yeah, so it's a difference. It's, but that's communication. And so what happens when this happens, right? I come home and I'm in trouble because I did this, whatever it may be. You're in trouble. And I say, and (laughs) I say, okay, honey, all monitor. Yes. And I say, honey, I understand that you'd like me to be a better communicator. And so next time, if we have plans to do this, I'll let you know ahead of time, let you know when I'm going, let you know when I'm back and I'll be a better communicator. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes you do say that, but other times you're just like, what does it matter? (laughs) (laughs) Well, nobody's perfect, honey. And I'm, I'm yeah. you know, topic of the day is communication. It's communication. So, and this is exactly why is we're key. talking about it. Because even though I think that Mike and I are very strong in the communication area for the most part, and we understand each other and we can communicate and resolve conflict really well, we still have our little things like this. I mean, this is such a dumb example, 
because it's not a significant thing. It's not important, but it's, it's an example of how as a woman, I'm like, tell me you're going to, you know, tell me what you're up to or what your plans are. And him being like, this doesn't matter. This is insignificant. And then me being like, well, it was premeditated. You knew you were going to do it because you brought all your stuff. There was a plan. (laughs) And then him being like, well, it doesn't matter. So anyway. Yeah. Communication is really important in a marriage. And I feel like you need to communicate and show that person that they're your partner. You know, that's, that's really what it is for me. I'll give you another example of a time where I did communicate, which I I'll pat myself on the back and I think it was a good thing. <laughs> it was just maybe yesterday or two days ago. That's why it's so, easy to remember. Silly me. <laughs> yeah. Silly me. A long time ago, I've always been a dreamer and I still am, but a oh, long time no. ago I had these plans to open a business. And then oh, yeah. not only did I want to open a business, but I thought it would be so smart that I'd have a holding company as well for the business because Mm -hmm. a holding company, you can have tax write-offs or whatever I thought I was going to do. I really thought it was brilliant. And this was a long time ago. (laughs) And uh, I incorporated these two businesses all by myself, all by my lonesome, uh, not really knowing anything. And so maybe I should have talked to a professional and realized that I didn't need to do this yet. Yeah. He Um, was like 22, you guys. Yeah. I was, I was young and young and silly. Um, so I opened these entities and then did absolutely nothing with them for the the next seven years or some odd amount of time. And now I finally realized that I've probably been accruing tax liabilities on these companies that I've had open. So I went to a CPA and, and let him know what I wanted to do. And he said, okay, I understand what you need to do here. And I understand you haven't made a dime out of this business and haven't spent a dime and there's nothing to do. And uh, I finally got the quote, which was going to be like $7,000 to close these two companies. And part of me was like, well, I really don't want Rebecca to know about this. So maybe I should just pay it and let them take care of it. Um, But the other day, I just, I was like, you know, honey, I got, remember I went to the CPA to talk about this and I got the quote and here's the quote. And she was like, whoa, (laughs) you are not doing that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like you need to at least get another quote or try to take care of this yourself. And I was so happy that I brought that up and got your, got your input, you know, got your, your take on it. And then I communicated with you because it made me realize like, I, I should definitely explore some other options. Yeah. You know, so that was really, that was really a big step for me because some things I would probably just, oh, I'm just going to do it. Um, but that's well, not, that's a lot that's of not money. the right way to be. Not so like I wouldn't notice. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of money. You know, it was a yeah. really big chunk of change to to go and do this. And it's like, you know, if we wait a little bit longer, it's already been seven years. What's <laughs> another year on the on the docket? So yeah, but see, here's the thing. First of all, thank you for telling me. I'm glad you told me and didn't try to just sweep it under the rug. Same. But w- as soon as you told me, I was like, that quote is ridiculous. First of all. And also you're a smart guy. And for those that don't know, Mike is not a CPA, but he is a trained accountant and he works in data and like, he can figure this out. It's going to be a lot of work. It's a lot of paperwork. That's the thing that's annoying about it. But if you can save yourself eight grand or whatever it is, it's worth it. So I think that was a good moment of communication because, you know, you just want to just be done with it or not deal with it. And I'm the type that's like, no, get other quotes or like, you could just do this. Look, here's some articles on this. I I don't think it's going to be that bad. So it is important to, for us to communicate with each other on these things because we can bounce ideas off of each other. And (laughs) it also gave us kind of an opportunity to laugh about this a little bit (laughs) because this was another thing that was early in our relationship that this went on. And so it was kind of funny to look back on that time and be like, oh my gosh, this thing is still hanging around from way back then. Like we got to tie this up. Once you file papers with the state, they don't go away. 
<laughs> so pray for me, guys. Hopefully I'll be able to take care of this and, and it won't cost us an arm and a leg. Yeah. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, you'll have resolved it. Mm, Maybe. I, I don't know when this is coming out, but I don't think it'll be long enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be a few months, but. Going to we'll take, take a hot minute. Yeah. Yep. Well, we also decided to pair the conversation on communication with conflict because they often go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Like Mike said, he avoided, he thought about avoiding communicating with me because he thought it might cause some conflict. And I think if he had been resolved to just pay this money to this one person that he got one quote from, and I was pushing back and being like, no, I think you need to explore other options. Then that could have, a conflict could have arisen from that, but you were open in that scenario to be like, oh yeah, I, that, that is what I needed to hear. Not to just go with this first situation. Totally. <laughs> and you responded with grace. You responded. It wasn't like, it wasn't a fight. It wasn't like, oh, what are you thinking? Like you shouldn't have done this in the first place. You know, you, you really handled it very well. And so I didn't, I didn't thank you for this before, but I, I do appreciate the way that you responded. You responded exactly the way I needed my partner to respond. Well, thank you. I do try my best. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you guys did not catch our episode on the book, love and respect, be sure to listen back a couple episodes. Many times when we communicate poorly, it can put us into what is called the crazy cycle. And it's where one person can speak disrespectfully. Well, in the example that the author gives, she speaks disrespectfully and he acts unlovingly and then it goes on and on. So yeah, that could have been how I responded to be like, ah, but instead I was kind of like, oh my gosh, that's kind of crazy. You know, we, we, we don't need to be doing that. So good communication, it really leads to a lot of great things when it comes to marriage. I know that you and I really wanted for both of us individually before we were together, we wanted a best friend and our spouse. And the only way that I believe that can be achieved is through good communicate, great communication, really not just good. You have to communicate really well between each other. And in our re-engage class, we learned that good communication results in marital oneness, which we discussed embracing oneness all the way back kind of at the beginning of this series. And we learned that the goal of communication is mutual understanding. So I want to kind of refer to the biblical context for this, which is in James 119. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry. And I feel like that's very, in, very interesting and important. And it also kind of reminds me of, was it Stephen Covey who um, has speak or uh, list, listen to understand wait, how does that go? You know what I'm trying Seek to say? First to understand, Thank you. then to be understood. Thank you. <laughs> speak first to understand, then to be understood. And in our re-engage class, we learned about some negative communication patterns. Mike already mentioned one of these. Well, sort of. But let's talk about those a little bit. So some of the ones that we talked about were escalate. Someone who escalates a situation. And this doesn't always mean screaming and yelling. It could also be more subtle, like sarcasm or name calling, threats, or other forms of attack. It's just, it escalates the situation because one person acts in a heated way. This is my biggest personal one that I do. I escalate. It is. I don't not going to throw you under the bus, but it definitely is. Yeah. I think you're just a very extreme person. And sometimes I don't, I don't think that you mean to be escalating. I think that you're just excited and passionate and emotional and things tend to escalate. And it's interesting because I, what I call tone match, like I feel like you're starting to get heated. And so I just respond with the way that I feel like you're talking 
and then you'll be like no i'm just i'm just venting to you you know like i'm not taking this out on you or anything and i'm like oh well i thought we were in an argument now like <laughs> yeah escalation yeah. is is a tough one and i it's also the most obvious negative communication pattern I think so too, because it's like pretty yeah. obvious that someone's escalating a situation or that it gets escalated because of a reaction. Yeah. It's the most obvious. So another one, I actually meant to say this one first, but I skipped it by accident, which is withdrawal and avoid. And this is an unwillingness to get into or stick with important discussions. And so I'm not going to throw you under the bus, but this is Mike's biggest one. <laughs> so Mike <laughs> is a withdrawer and I'm an escalator. And so that's kind of a funny dynamic. <laughs> the funniest thing to me in the book was because they do withdraw first, they say something to the effect of like, um, you know, you have to really try to not walk away from conversations, you know, stay in it, whatever. And then and escalate. It's basically like you need to withdraw. More. You may need to withdraw to de-escalate the situation. You need to go, go get yourself together. And so it was kind of funny that the one th the withdrawal is seen as a negative, but to an escalator, it's like a solution for them. I don't know. Yeah, but I do think it's an appropriate solution. It's funny and ironic that one of the negative communication patterns is a solution to another. Mm -hmm. But it does make sense. If somebody's really blown their lid off, you you may need to simmer down a little bit. Take simmer down exactly, yeah. and and remove yourself from the situation and wait until a cooler head prevails. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of merit in that. Mm -hmm. And for to talk about my weakness, the withdraw and avoid. I definitely will feel like oh. I'd like, I don't even want to talk about this. You know, I don't, I'm not going to get anywhere. I, there's no point that I need to make. And so I'll just be quiet. And it's very interesting. This, this re-engage program has given us now tools to say right in the moment where it's like, uh, you're withdrawing right now, you know, or you're escalating the situation. Um, it's really interesting. And, and when you put a, put a label on it, it allows you to better be able to handle the situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it gives you the tools when you really are able to identify it in the moment and you say, this is withdrawal. And it's like, okay, maybe I could do a better job communicating right now. It is funny that you say that because, and this is the thing that I love about participating in a class like this is so many people think, you go, you're going to marriage class. Like, oh my gosh, are you guys like at the end of your rope? Someone yeah, you actually asked me that, like, are you guys what? okay? You're going yeah, to this yeah. class? But I think that everyone should invest in their relationship and their marriage because you will learn things like this and you're learning it here on this podcast. So I guess keep listening to this podcast, right? But we should all learn things continuously that will remind us, or I guess really what I mean is do things together as a, as a married couple, like a marriage class at your church, where it's going to teach you uh, to think about these tools, because it's so easy to go through the day to day. And we just go through the same old, same old, same old, and we don't realize the negative patterns that we get into, or, you know, just the little things that we could fix very easily if we could name it and we knew what it was. I don't even remember what it was, but cause it was like a month ago, but there was a situation or a moment where I wanted to talk about something and it was right before bed. And Mike was like, no. And I'm like, don't withdraw. <laughs> You're withdrawing. And he ignored me. And then a couple of minutes later, he's rolled over and he's like, you're right. I don't want to withdraw and avoid. Let's talk about this. And then we just talked about it and it was over. I, whatever it was, it's pretty insignificant. I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. But I think that knowing and naming these things, just like when we talked about grace, being able to, if I, we hadn't have been in a study on grace very recently, in the example that I gave in that episode on grace, I probably wouldn't have recognized that moment. 
you know? And so these kinds of things are very important for us to continuously be reminded about. Yeah. And I, I would definitely advocate for the re-engage class or any yeah. other type of class with your church or community anywhere. And it's much better to do it when things are good because <laughs> you may, ha- you may get some tools that when things are rocky, you may be able to, to use and, you know, you don't want to be the couple that's on life support in one of these things. It's nice to, nice to do it when things are good because we did it when things are good. And f- part of me, to be honest, was like, ah, oh, we really need this. this is going to be a waste of time. And from the very first class, I was like, you know what? I'm really glad we're doing this because we're identifying things and learning things about ourselves and each other that are just helping us to grow and and helping us to have a stronger foundation in our relationship. And to be the communicator in our relationship right now, (laughs) while Mike went into it thinking, do we really need to do this right now? I still had some unhealed wounds from last year. And while I had forgiven Mike, I just felt like we needed to do this class because and I think I mentioned this when we first started the marriage series that we had the intention of doing this class because of what we went through at, with the, the day that our son was born. So listen back to that episode, <laughs> episode nine, I think it is eight or nine. And we were, we actually tried to sign up for re-engage, but they ended up canceling it that time because there was a conflict. Some, some stuff was going on. And so we never went. And when this came around again, I just felt like the Lord was like, you guys need to go to this. You know, you guys need to do this. Sure. You forgiven him and you guys have moved forward, but this was still an opportunity for us to, like Mike said, grow together and keep working on our relationship. Like, even though we had gotten through a hard time, it doesn't mean that we don't continue to work and continue to go through things. And honestly, it actually, we were talking about this the other day. It really worked out that we didn't do it when we did it because our baby would have been a baby, baby, like newborn baby. And now he's older and they have childcare for our class. So, you know, there's folks there that are able to watch everyone's kids. And I would have had a really hard time. Like, I don't know that I would have been able to even do that at that time, just being a couple months postpartum. And as much as you're nursing and like, you're going to leave the house and I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving a newborn with anyone. (laughs) So I think it all, the timing of it all worked out. So it's just to say, I'd, enc- I'd encourage folks to do re-engage too. And I've also heard from our leaders, our small group leaders at re-engage that they're making some edits to the curriculum and stuff like that and moving some of the topics around and things of that nature. So that will be cool and fresh. If you've done re-engage before, it sounds like, you know, you could go through it again. People go through it mul- more than one time. Definitely. So I think we get a lot out of it every time that we do it. I mean, heck, I think our, our small group leaders have been, have done it a couple of times because they've been small group leaders and they say that they get a lot out of it every time they do it. Anyway, back to the negative communication pattern. So we have withdrawn, avoid, and we have escalate. The next one is negatively interpret, which we talked about that last episode a little bit, I think, or earlier. That's when you assign motive to your spouse that is more negative than is really the case. So very presumptive or assumptive in many ways. Do you want to comment on that one at all? Yeah, this is a bad one. Um, This is a bad (laughs) one. (laughs) This is one that I feel like we've had in our past a little bit. Um, And it's really hard, right? Because when someone doesn't believe your motives are true or like they don't, this is really a trust issue. I think the negatively interpret is really a trust issue. Um, And it it hurts when you are doing the right thing or when you do something that you think is nice 
or you're doing something that you like aren't even thinking about and it gets interpreted in a negative way that's really hard mm-hmm. um and so the the solution to this one is just believing the best believing the best in your partner and having faith in your partner uh, this is this can be a really bad one and it's a slippery slope i think this yeah. one i think is is like small hard to identify but really important really important the negatively interpret can you give an example to folks on negative interpretation as a negative communication pattern i can try um i want to try to use a real example i can't think of of a perfectly specific one but fairly recently maybe I was apologizing for something or I was trying to explain something to you and you were like, well, I don't believe you. And to me, like, that's a negatively, that's a negative interpretation. Like, I don't believe you. I don't think what you're saying is true. Um, Mm -hmm. And that that's hard because it's like, now where do we go from there? Cause I'm trying to apologize or I'm, I'm trying to tell you something and you're not believing me it's like, but my intentions are good. You know, what am I supposed to do with that? And that it's, it's a very challenging one to overcome. I have an example I can give. All right. So have we talked about the laundry on this series yet? <laughs> I, I can't imagine that we haven't mentioned laundry once at least. But laundry is like a big thing in Mike and I's relationship because laundry he, is the hardest thing. The hardest he, thing we have I don't to even, go through. He had grew up you guys in New York city. They don't have washers and dryers there. Like that's not a thing. My house didn't have a wash and dryer my whole life. You could, they could have gotten one, but they didn't. Cause it's just, it's a, it's a hazard. You know, if you live in a multi-family and you have a washer and a dryer, it's just another thing that could go wrong and leak everywhere. So Mike grew up getting the laundry done for him. At the laundromat, the people there, they did it and they folded it. Thank you. Perfectly. Clara. Thank in you like for this the perfect, years of my beautiful laundry. In this perfect cube and then dropped it on the door step. And then his mom would take it out of the bag and put his perfectly cubed pile on his bed. And he always had it or dry cleaning. His mom would dry clean his clothes that he would wear to school he wore a different tie every day. He always had all these clothes and it was always something that was taken care of for him growing up. Completely, completely. He never thought about it. Like he wore the clothes. I don't even know what he did with them. He probably threw them on the floor. Threw them right and... in the trash after I wore it once. What? <laughs> I wore it once and threw it right in the trash. Yeah, probably. So Mike never had to do anything with laundry in his whole, whole life. When he went to college, he did live away for a bit in college. And during that time, he used the washer and dryer himself. I did laundry like six times that semester. (laughs) He didn't have that many clothes. And he wasn't doing like dry cleaning, obviously. Just he wasn't handling the dry cleaning. He was just the day-to-day schlep wear he was wearing. So (laughs) fast forward to us getting into a relationship it was like assumed that I was the laundry maid, the laundry maiden. That was me. (laughs) (laughs) And listen, like I know how to do laundry, obviously, because I've lived this long, I've had to do it, but I cannot keep up with the sheer quantity of clothing that goes on his body. It's like, (laughs) well, think back, think back. Not today. It's different now than it used to be. It was workout clothes, work clothes, and casual clothes, like three different outfits a day. And me too, I was wearing multiple clothes a day. And so we, I, I always had a hard time keeping up with laundry. It's just a difficult thing. Fast forward. Now we have kids and we have twice as much clothing and items to do and twice as many three times as many beds and 
just, it's just, it's never ending. Right. And the whole reason I'm mentioning this story is because this is like one of the most, the biggest conflicts that Mike and I have had in our relationship has been over laundry. laundry. And part of it is the assumption that I'm the laundry maiden, but the other part of it is the way that I have negatively interpreted his laundry, the way he thinks about the house and laundry that I feel judged that I feel like I'm not a good wife. I feel like I suck because I can't keep up with it. And because I can't make sure that it's always done and everybody's stuff is always clean and folded in a perfect cube. And even if it was sitting on the bed, he would knock it off. And then I have to refold it into a perfect cube again. And so that's where negative interpretation comes in for me is that I negatively interpret that because I know that he has had this history with never having to deal with laundry, that if I don't meet that standard, I suck. So there's my example. I'll say, I don't judge you based on how good of a laundry maiden you are. (laughs) I just want you to know that. And I have also offered numerous times that we could just let the laundry build up for two months and then drop it off and have them <laughs> wash dry fold. But you've never taken me up on my offer. Not yet. No, not yet. because I don't want my, I have a washer and a dryer. I don't want to take it there if I don't have to. But you can have somebody else do it and then you don't have to do it. Well, and you don't I have think, to fold it. You know, And then maybe we can get somebody or a robot to put it away. And then our lives would be perfect. Yeah, our lives would be perfect. If we just had a robot to do our laundry, then every problem in our whole relationship would be solved. We'd have no more problems. Everything would be solved. All of our problems revolve around laundry at this point. What are we even doing here? That's that's we need to be focusing our maybe we should invent this so that we We need to invent it. The only thing is I definitely shouldn't open a company before we have the invention. (laughs) Like my wheels are already turning. If I I open this company. Use one of those incorporations you got. <laughs> I'm closing them. I need to close them. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's a way, a, a, a negative interpretation example. Another one in one of the stories that we heard was one of the videos we watched for class was about meals. Like uh, the wife was calling the husband to be like, what time are you coming home? And he took that as her saying like, when are you coming home? Like, you know, you're not, you're just off having fun and not having to do anything. And I'm at home with the kids. Like he was, he was totally interpreting what she was saying. And she literally was just wanting to know, like, when are you going to be home? So dinner will be ready when you get home. So that's another example. But I do think a lot of women probably think that of their husbands when they're at work because i think i know that you is, certainly do we can and it's because you're always you, playing disc golf man <laughs> <laughs> so fun and game this is really nice i know i i've learned in the couple of years that i've been working at my company that i can't come home and tell my wife how good of a day i had and how nice everything was and how good the food was and how we all had fun and and did things I've learned I have to come home. Oh, honey, my day was hard. This was a hard day. So he's, what are you, what are you saying? That you lie to me? No, I would never say that. <laughs> you would never say that, but is that what you're doing? No. Wait, so is the food not. really good? Because you've been telling me it's not. <laughs> Food's okay. Food's okay. <laughs> Nothing to write home about, you know, honey. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh man. All right. Let's get into the last one. The last negative communication pattern is invalidate. And this occurs when you directly or indirectly dismiss, minimize, or put down the thoughts, feelings, or character of your spouse. Hmm. Rebecca's totally uh, giving me the eyes right now and directing (laughs) this, this one to me because this is my worst offender for sure. 
this is yes. definitely my worst offender. I do it to my wife. I do it to my three-year-old child. <laughs> and this is this is my bad one. This is the one I'm working on. I because I see this as being very closely akin, if not the same, as gaslighting. And for those it of is, you that don't know word. what gaslighting is, gaslighting is when someone tries to make you feel crazy when you're not, or they totally invalidate whatever it is that you're feeling or thinking, and they turn it around and they twist it all around and manipulate the situation. And I think that's why I resonate with this invalidation so much because I'm in gaslit a time or two by this one here. Who, me? <laughs> yeah, you. No, it couldn't be. <laughs> couldn't be. That gaslight is out. Yeah, better be. You run out of gas yet? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> actually the whole story, right? It came from some play or something that the light is on and then he turns it off every time she turns around or whatever it is like so mm -hmm. the light's off honey I would you never know gaslight you. it's funny because sometimes when this happens or when something like this has happened i've said that to mike i've been like stop gaslighting me and he'll be like stop using that word i taught you what it is and i'm like just because you taught me what the word gaslighting means doesn't mean you're not doing it right now. Well, here's the thing. I think sometimes fairly, fairly often now she'll say that I'm gaslighting her, but really I believe that it's her negative interpretation of what I'm saying. And, and we're just in the crazy cycle. At that uh, point. So yeah. we're not perfect either guys. Yeah. You're invalidating and I'm negatively interpreting and it's just spins around and, and just around goes around and around yeah it is it, somebody throws in the towel it's funny you mentioned our three-year-old because i feel like he's gotten better at this with me like not doing this as much not invalidating me as much because he knows he can't try to tell me i okay so i'll give you an example like if he said something and it made me feel a certain way, hurt my feelings. And he will be like, well, I didn't mean it like that. It doesn't mean that it didn't hurt my feelings. It still did. And so he's learned, he can't try to convince me that my feelings aren't hurt, which he has tried to do before, I but he realizes have. he can't try to convince me of that. So he's gotten better with me, but then I notice him doing it to our three-year-old where he'll be, he'll try to convince her that she's not feeling a certain way or not to do a certain thing. And she's just like, no, <laughs> she, she's not buying it. And in those moments, I've been like, wait a second. And now after, again, this is another tool after recognizing what an invalidation looks like, being able to say to him, like, you can't convince her that she doesn't want that thing or that she doesn't feel, you know, that she hurt her knee for the 500th time and that it doesn't hurt her. Like you have to just go with it. So it's interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've shared this in our marriage series yet, but I did share this, this tidbit of wisdom with our re-engage class. And that's that the husband has to take all the blame <laughs> no matter what. And the key mm -hmm. to truly happy and conflict-free marriage is for the husband to just take all the blame and anything that happens as long as the husband owns it then everything will be good and so that's that's one of the things that I've learned and dealing with my daughter it's the same thing even if she's crying over something that doesn't really matter I can't try to convince her that it doesn't matter I have to just meet her where she is and understand she's three because she's three <laughs> and maybe she is being a little irrational but that doesn't three. matter because i can't rationalize with her yeah i have to meet her where she is and i have to comfort her and she as my daughter she needs me her father to console her and to to comfort her not 
to try to convince her and change her mind. She just needs me to console her. And it's the same thing with my wife is that this, maybe this was a good topic for the forgiveness episode that we could have gotten into a little bit, but there were things that you would say, you know, I can't believe you did this and you made me feel this way. And I'll go, well, it's not what I meant. So, you know, get over it. Like, that's not what I was trying to do. And I, I've learned that my intentions or my perspective or where, where I'm coming from doesn't really matter if you feel a certain way nothing matters but the fact that you feel this way and that I need to meet you where you're at and comfort you and try to fix the situation I just need to fix the situation with you I don't need to prove why you shouldn't feel the way that I made you feel yeah that that's not the right approach yeah and it took us some time to get to this place and then it took you some time to get to that place too, but now you're very smart. You're a very smart man for getting it to say, I'm not going to try to change how she feels. She feels how she feels. I can't convince her not to feel that way. I have to accept it. And I want to point something out. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. And take the blame. (laughs) I want to point something out about our three-year-old is that she's three and they say that the brain does not finish developing until, well, I know for men, at least it's like 25. So think about that from that perspective. She's, it's like, you're a mathematician. How many times lifetimes is that if you're three? Yeah, it's a lot. It's like over seven. It's like eight. Seven yeah. Or eight. yeah. Almost eight times. Yeah. yeah that's an lot. interesting perspective. And about the the men's brain development, I would say, that men's brain starts developing at 25. (laughs) (laughs) That's probably true too. (laughs) Well, I mean, maybe by finished developing, it means it finally is at full capacity to be used for you. To start working. (laughs) It finally starts working around then. Mine started working around 29. I'm 30 now. Oh yeah. So So not not very long, huh? Yeah. Well, let's talk about what the Bible has to say about communication. In Ephesians 4.29, it says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. In Proverbs 15.1, it says a soft answer will turn away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. In Colossians 4.6, it says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Psalm 141.3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Watch over the door of my lips. Proverbs 12.18, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And in Proverbs 18.2, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. So communication and conflict go hand in hand because how we communicate dictates what happens when there is a conflict. And a great reminder that we learned in re-engage was when it came to overlooking minor offenses. So I'm going to read to you guys a little blurb about that. As a general rule, an offense should be overlooked if you can answer no to all of the following questions. Is the offense dishonoring God? Has it permanently damaged a relationship? Is it hurting other people? Is it hurting the offender himself? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you need to address the issue with your spouse. If all of the answers are no, oftentimes it's wise to extend grace to your spouse and let the issue go. So I thought that was really interesting I think the biggest one, you know, when it comes to little things, it's like, is this going to permanently damage our relationship if this isn't talked about, or is it hurting somebody? Those are probably going to be the big ones that, that stick out, at least to me anyway. 
<laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I liked I liked that list, that little checklist. Um, to be totally honest, I did not find that as useful because I tend to let a lot go. I'm I'm easy, <laughs> easy going, and and I'm able to really let a lot go. It takes a lot to to really offend me because I feel like I understand people are not perfect and that things happen and I've made my own fair share of offenses and so I kind of let people let things slide pretty easily and it's also easy being married to you because you're just a perfect angel so I don't I don't have a ton of stuff that I need to go through that checklist for but I will say that some others in our group found that checklist to be very useful mm -hmm. because it sounds like maybe they have a lot of bones to pick and this might help them to filter out the number of arguments that they need to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause they could say, other. does it meet this checklist or does it not? So it may be helpful to some people. I think the one that I pointed out in my own notes to like myself was, is it hurting other people? I think is pretty subjective, right? That's the one that's kind of like what hurts one person might not hurt another person. It, it could be a little bit subjective, but you know, we have to also kind of ask ourselves like, what is a big offense? Because this, this is about the bigger stuff, right? I mean, if you're getting in fights over like the little things all the time, then I don't know that that's kind of a different conversation in many I ways. That's what this was meant to avoid. It's like, mm -hmm. if you're just in constant conflict, cause you can't let anything go. Mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta try to let some things slide here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I, I definitely, I am a firm believer in letting things slide. If something's really a problem, I'm going to bring it up, you know, but, but most of the time, mm -hmm. especially with the people that I love, especially with the people that I love with you and with very close friends. And I've, I've said this to you and, and family, I believe that family you got to just, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter what people do. If some, if I really had a problem with something from our family, then I would address it right where it's at. And it's not like a blow up. It's like, Hey, I, I need to address this with you. But mm -hmm. I've, I've said this multiple times. Like, I just, I feel like family is really important and you love your family and you got to just let them go. I have to piggyback on this because what part of what Mike is referring to is siblings. So Mike is an only child and he never had siblings. And obviously you guys know my sister, Rachel, and we also have two brothers. And over the years, we've all gotten into spits and spats about really minor, stupid things, but they've blown up into bigger things. And not all of us, I shouldn't say like all of us at the same time kind of thing, but like, you know, here and there, we all have our disagreements. And when Mike came into the family, he was like, I just don't understand how you guys could ever fight with each other. You are family and your siblings. And I just could never be mad at any of them, that <laughs> any of my brothers or sisters, meaning his now in-law siblings. And when I told Rachel about this, she was like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> She's like, that's so cute that he, <laughs> he just, you know, kind of can't fathom that siblings would fight with each other because he's like, I never had siblings. So I would appreciate and honor that relationship. And I think that that's a, it's a refreshing view for us to consider too, that, you know, we take, we, um, take for granted was the word I was looking for. We take for granted that we have siblings because we have siblings. We don't know what it's like to not have siblings. So for us, it's like, oh, we disagree. Then, you know, whatever happens from there. And then we talk it out or we hash it out or whatever the case might be. For you, you're like, no, they're just don't get in a disagreement. I never had siblings. Like I would, I would honor this. This would be yeah. honorable to me. Yeah. I, I don't understand how someone's going to fight. I, I know anybody could get into an argument, but I just really feel like 
you got to just let things go. Like nobody's perfect. Every, you know, I really feel blessed to have siblings that you. Well, that's why siblings fight though, is because we love each other because we love each other. It is very easy to be hurt and offended by someone that you love and you care about. Cause if you didn't love and care about somebody, you wouldn't ever get upset with them. You wouldn't care. You know, I guess I just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think siblings should fight. Like even to see our kids fight and like, they're little, they're teeny tiny. Our they kids don't, even don't know fight. What they're doing. Brooke fights. Yeah. Brooke to be <laughs> yanking on Ben and wrestling him and stuff and he doesn't even know what's going on <laughs> he's like a little baby he's one you know, i take it very seriously though like i don't want them to fight and, and yeah. maybe there's nothing i could do about it and it's just natural and it is what it is but mm-hmm. i really want to try to instill in them that we're a team like we need to work together it's really important to work together we're lucky that we have each other and we got to have each other's back we can't be infighting yeah It helps though. It definitely helps to have those conversations with her because I noticed after some encouragement with that the other day, then she was like, Oh, Ben, you're my baby. You're, you're my little baby guy. You're my friend. I'm taking care of you. You know, she, she was verbally expressing what she was being taught by you and by me that you have to love your brother. You know, he's your, he's your friend. He's your best friend. Exactly. And it takes constant encouragement, especially at this age that our kids are at or that our toddlers at for her, because she needs the reminders. Everything that we say is so important right now, which is why communication is different for us right now, because we're not only communicating with each other, but how we communicate with each other is an extension to our children now, you know, and how we talk to each other and the things that we say and all that they're learning from us now. Definitely. We better get it right, man. <laughs> yeah. We better try. <laughs> yeah. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to throw out there? Final thoughts on communication or conflict? I think communication is really important, especially in times of conflict. You have to communicate with your spouse and your spouse should be your partner above all else. And we didn't talk about this before. I I thought about it, but didn't get the opportunity to really say this. That's something that you've done extremely well um, going all the way back to the beginning of our relationship, putting me first and for us to be each other's number one and best friend and confidant and the person that we would go to was each other. And I think that really built a very strong relationship for us because even when things were rocky between us, it's not like we were going to other people and like talking smack and, you know, getting bad perspective and and stuff like that. So I think it really, it really helped us, especially early on. Mm -hmm. And now I, th- I think that our relationship is a model of how communication and, and partnership is supposed to be because we're each other's number one. And when we're going to do something, we talk about it and we, two heads are better than one. You know, we put our heads together and we're able to, to talk and communicate and make decisions together. And I really appreciate that we have that. And I, I hope that others can find that as well. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Well, the more you focus on it and continue to grow together in that area, the more fruit I think you're going to see from it too. So thank you for that. That was a very sweet closing thought. Next week, we are going to be talking about understanding your spouse. So that'll be a fun one. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in, being on this journey with us. If you'd like to follow along outside the podcast, you can join the mission on Instagram or Facebook at The Radiant Mission, or you can watch this podcast in video format on YouTube. Today, we're closing with Psalm 1914, 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We're wishing you a radiant week. We'll see you next time. Bye. Don't shout. Talk it out. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Bye.